If the wind is right, you could fly from Westray Island in Scotland to Papa Westray in 53 seconds. A trip you could easily make by boat. This is the shortest commercial flight in the world and is of course an extreme example. But so many flights are almost as unnecessary and absurd, especially on the European continent. But more and more people are flying and emissions are going up with them. So some countries are bringing in bans. France has officially banned short-distance domestic flights in an effort to cut the country's carbon emissions. It's for journeys possible in less than two and a half hours by train. And others are looking to follow. But not everybody's a fan of the ban. They don't really work. So will Europe ground short-haul flights? And will this work to curb emissions or back? The busiest commercial routes in Europe are also laughably short. The flight between Madrid and Barcelona takes only an hour and a half. And when you add the time it takes to get to the airport, clear security, the entire thing can take much longer than the train. In fact, one third of the busiest flight routes in Europe can be done by train in under six hours. Yet 1.8 million people fly just between the two Spanish cities each year. Each passenger that flies, even economy, is responsible for up to 80 times more emissions than they would be if they had taken the train. Of course, flying premium class can create many times more than that since one person takes up the space and emissions that could be shared by many. If we banned all premium class flights and made everyone fly economy, we would save 25% of global aviation emissions overnight and still transport the same number of people. But luxury travel is a whole different topic that we talk about in another video. Overall, long-haul flights emit the biggest chunk of pollution, but currently there's no way to make them cleaner at scale. Short-haul flights create less emissions, but they are much easier to replace. There's just one main obstacle. So the price you're paying will very much determine which kind of transportation you're using. This is Stefan Gersling, a transport expert who cannot get on board with low airline prices. Okay, let's see what a flight costs from London to Vienna next week. It's 25 euros. That's nothing. And now we do the train. The cheapest ticket for next week is 323 euros. I need to calm down a second. I need a glass of water. Flights being so cheap is actually part of a deliberate design. Uh, we identified, for instance, 14 different types of subsidies that are forwarded to airlines. Uh, you might even include carbon dioxide as a subsidy um, because we know it has a cost but airlines don't pay for it. In aviation we have many many different types of subsidies such as the fact that you don't pay uh, value-added tax on international flights for instance. There's also a kerosene tax exemption. In Europe you actually pay tax on the fuel in your car but you don't pay tax on it to fly. But even in terms of direct state aid subsidies forwarded to, forward to airlines in, in times of crisis. And uh, all of that is an issue. To justify all this, the airline industry often points to the convenience of air travel and the right to freedom of movement within the continent, which policymakers often accept. But European taxpayers lose billions of euros every year, propping the industry up. And even though very few people fly, everybody pays money to the airlines. Changing this setup would involve governments, international aviation authorities, lobbies, amending the EU taxation law and carbon markets. So banning flights on certain routes is just easier. The Netherlands and Belgium tried, but there was a lot of pushback. It wasn't easy for the French and Austrian governments to put these bans in place either. In France, the original plan was to ban flights along eight national routes. But after much protest from the airline industry and lobby groups, it was watered down to three. The industry argues that this ban won't make a difference, which in a way is true. This particular ban only cuts 2.6% of domestic flight emissions in France. If other countries are successful, it could make a bigger impact in absolute terms. But if you want to make people stop flying short distances, banning is one thing. There have to also be attractive alternatives for people. So last year, my husband and I went to Lisbon. He flew back, but I didn't want to fly. 
It cost him around 51 euros and six hours door to door. I took the land route that included one bus and three trains that took me 50 hours, including an overnight in Madrid, and cost me 400 euros. Because while national train routes are quite good in a lot of Europe, problems usually start at the border. There are different gauges in neighboring countries, different electrifying systems, different train control systems, which means you likely need to change trains. And you often need to book each leg separately and each country has its own system. But change is happening. Under the EU Green Deal, the European Commission has been working on better connecting the rail network and integrating rail with roads, waterways and airports. In Sweden, some short haul routes have already disappeared because traveling by train or road has become more attractive. And my favorite development, night trains are coming back. So, with all this, how effective is banning short haul flights at saving emissions? We considered 87 routes in, in Germany that are less than 600 kilometers long and less than six hours in uh, travel time uh, by railway. Pere Sanchez looked at a host of actual savings of carbon and other emissions if these routes are substituted. So in the most credible scenario, we could save around 2% uh, of CO2 emissions uh, from those emissions generated in those uh, 87 routes. This could go up to 22% if a majority of flights were banned. But since that's not very realistic at the moment, we're still looking at around 2%. This is already a saving in terms of CO2, but on the other hand, uh, clearly shows the limitations of this sort of measures. There are a few factors that could push savings even below 2%. If only some airports ban flights between each other, passengers could just use a different airport nearby or take a connecting flight via a different airport. This can mean more short haul flights on those routes and more emissions overall. This is more likely to be the case for business travelers than those on holiday. It's very much in the DNA of the business air traveler. You stay within the airport, which is a highly structured environment. Um, people will recognize you because you have a golden tag on your bag. Uh, you're getting into the launch where you're treated with some champagne before you're boarding. And then airport slots are limited. At the moment, you might have these slots at airports that are given to short-haul flights. But if they disappear, they might be given to medium or long-haul flights, and then the total emissions in the system would increase. And then most short-haul flights in Europe don't have a train alternative. Building these would also add CO2 emissions now. But it's really the long term we need to be looking at. Because here's the thing about aviation. While it accounts for less than 3% of overall emissions right now, by 2050, it's predicted to take up one quarter of the global carbon budget. So one way or another, we have to curtail emissions. The question is, are bans the way to go? It's sort of against the Western idea of freedom and um, democracy. Competition is very important. This has been one of the key aspects of the construction of the European Union. Bans is not, they don't really work. And that's why, you know, here is where it's important that we work in a more constructive way. This includes making trains more attractive, cheaper tickets, better connections, simpler booking systems, taxing kerosene and VAT on flights. And there is a need for a Europe-wide approach so this doesn't backfire. For the moment, uh, short-haul bans are essentially useful because they are symbolic. They, they show that the government can do something, that they take action that they are not looking on and where it's clearly avoidable to, um, to emit, then there is an option for governments to hop in and introduce legislation. The bulk of the problem is still long-haul flights, but until we can fly on cleaner fuels, we can start cutting emissions where we can. What's it like where you live? How are the trains? Are people flying like crazy? Is cutting down even a discussion? Let us know in the comments and come back every Friday for more videos.